is a teaching. Yes, I found one yesterday, so will that I knew any one of those. That's why. Go wherever you want. Uh, so um, I know that Kinderen, har du kinderen til mig? Men det bør ikke begynne, det er bare slik at hvis jeg skal gå fort på det, så... Ja, det ligger på, jeg må på skolebordet her, om jeg ser her nede. Så... Vi får vi den da. Ja, da er vi inn på det. Så er jeg på vei opp der. Er du født eller noe? Ja, jeg er født. Da er det fem. Vi kommer litt av skjermen der da. Ok, men det skal vente, for jeg har presset på smått. Ja, det er smått. Men så går vi videre på denne da. Ja, da får vi klippe til denne etter da. Ja, så tar vi en tilbake der. Ja, men da styrer du den. Ja, det er det. Ja, jeg har en liten introduksjonsplass. Så er det det.
Hi, everyone. <laughs> and uh, welcome to this session about the European Court of Human Rights and Child's Rights. My name is Trond Hallon, and I'm from the University of Bergen, currently a master's student there. I will give a brief presentation, uh, an introduction to children's relation to the Convention of Human Rights and the court before I present the panel. Article 1 of the Convention states that the rights presented in the Convention shall be granted to everyone. Article 14 explicitly mentions that age discrimination is a violation against the Convention. Both of these facts are seemingly ignored with regards to children. The Convention does not mention at which age a child may enjoy its rights, nor are there any written differences between a young children and children near adulthood's relation to the Convention. When it comes to cases involving minors, the European Court of Human Rights look at each case separately, leaving the decision of whether or not the child is entitled to its rights up to the court's discretion. As I said, the court uh, or the convention does not mention when a child is entitled to his rights. It does not even mention when childhood uh, begins or ends, but it has been defined by court. In the case of Peyton versus the United Kingdom from 1980, it was a question of whether or not the unborn child should be protected by the convention. Uh, the court then examined the term everyone and it found that both in Article 2 and in the Convention as a whole, the term everyone could only be applied postnatally. Even though the court found that the term could only be used postnatally, they could not rule out the possibility that in rare cases a prenatal application could occur. Even though children's rights are not explicitly mentioned in the Convention, there are still some uh, articles that open for preferential treatment of minors. Article 5 states that minors may be detained for the purpose of educational supervision, and Article 6 states that the present public may be excluded from any legal proceedings regarding juveniles. When ruling in a case which involves minors, the court has been very tolerant in domestic laws and practices that treats children differently from adults. The court has stated that it's justified to treat children differently if the aim is to protect children from harm or negative influence. As stated in the written introduction in a pamphlet to this session, Article 8 of the Convention has been in focus lately. Norway has nine cases before the court where parents disagree with the state's child welfare intervention. Article 8 states that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. Furthermore, Article 8 underlines that there will be no interference from public authority with a few exceptions. Among the exceptions, we find that the authorities will act to protect health and morals and the right and freedom of others here and their children. To bring us further into this topic, we have a great panel with us today. We have Geishal Andersland from Hordland and Sognefjord in the County uh, Social Welfare Board. We have Conor Mahoney from uh, the Faculty of Law at University College Cork. Katra Luhama from the Center for Research on Discretion and Paternalism at University of Bergen. And Karl Harald Sjövik from the Faculty of Law at University of Bergen. There will be a possible uh, opportunity to ask questions to the panel at the end of this session. The first presentation from the candidates. So, Gershon, please. Thank you. It's better to leave the applause to afterwards. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, I'll give us brief talk about this uh, big, big issue. Um, I'm working as uh, in the county social welfare board. It's for all practical purposes a sort of uh, court. We make decisions in, take, in placing children outside home, care orders and so on, adoptions and so on. And our decisions can be uh, tried of the ordinary courts in Norway, the city court, the high court, for that matter, the Supreme Court. Um, 
in this field, uh, we, of course, all, and that, that means I'm, I'm a lawyer. I have to be a lawyer to have this position. Um, it's also so that Norwegian lawyers and judges, um, that's elementary, is supposed to follow decisions in our Supreme Court. But at least for the last 10 or 15 years, I would say that also international decisions, especially in European Court of Human Rights, is a, a very, very important source when we make decisions. And that's why it's so important to see how this court handle the cases. Um, Tron has already uh, shown you this picture. This is, this is the, in a way, the, the main uh, section in, 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 um, in the Human Rights, uh, in the Convention of Human Rights and Fundamental Free Freedom, just call it the Convention, when we are talking about these, these cases. Uh, I, you just see it, but of course the key words is interference. Uh, I mean, the main rule is respect for family life. But there are cases where you might, from the public uh, side, interfere in this uh, family life. And of course, every interference, in a way, is a violation, isolated, is a violation of the respect of the family life. And then you have to have very, very uh, good reasons for doing that. And that's reasons which you see here. It should be in, court, in accordance with the law. Of course, in Norway, that will be the, 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 car, the, the, the child welfare law. And it has to be necessary in a democratic society to obtain several purposes, for instance, the protection of health and so on. So the point is that um, this article, I mean, we are talking about uh, children's rights. And of course, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child is our key source when we are talking about that. But in these cases, we have to have a, have, have a view on ex ex especially Article 8 in the Convention, the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, that's a more key source for the, for the court in Strasbourg than Unfortunately, maybe, but at least that's the case. That's the, the key source for the decision in, in the European Court. Um, and then I have dived into some of the decisions uh, against Norway in the last year, just to give you an example of how the courts uh, uh, make their thinking. And you will say that um, the, the starting point this was said always in, in 1995, Adela Jonsson, it's, it's a very famous or infamous uh, case uh, of adoption. Uh, but the normally, uh, every taking a child into care without the consent of the family or the parents should normally be regarded as a temporary measure. So it's, it's a point that you should do everything afterwards to try to reunite the family. That's the ultimate aim of reuniting the natural parent and the child. And this was uh, many years ago. But it's interesting that as last as this year, the court again stress or underline that this is the guiding principle that there should be a temporary measure to place a child outside their home. So is there a complete picture? Uh, you can have an impression that uh, reuniting the family, it's the ultimate aim, but it's not the only aim. Because uh, the court has many, many times also said that where children are involved, the best interest must be taken into account. And the court reiterates that there is a broad consensus, including international law, in support of the, the idea that all decisions concerning child and their best interest are of paramount importance. And that brings us to what we are talking about, the two limbs. Um, on the one hand, the best interest of the child um, is that the child's ties with his family must be maintained, except in cases where the family has proved 
particular unfit. On the other hand, it is clearly also in the child's interest to ensure its development in a zone environment, and a parent cannot be entitled under Article 8 of the Convention to have such measures taken as would harm the child's health and development. And that is the, that is the key question always. Uh, is that necessary in a democratic society to place the child outside its family because if not, the child's best interest would be harmed in, 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 in a serious way, of course, in a serious way. Um, it also said that when a considerable period of time has passed since the child was first placed in care, the child's interest in not undergoing further de facto changes to the family situation may prevail over the parents in seeing the family reunited. And then to adoption. Uh, we are talking both of care orders. Care orders is a decision placing the child in a foster family or outside the natural family um, with, um, with the different contexts for the family. The parents will be allowed to see a child two years, two, two times a year, ten times a year. It's a sort of a decision in care orders that there also is a, is a decided how, how often should a parent and a child have the right to see each other. And as long as you have a care order, there will always, at least in theory, be a possibility that the family can be reunited. But when you make an adoption decision, you are, per definition, cutting all roots. We have uh, some possibilities in Norway today to have some contact, but talking broadly, adoption is a very, very uh, serious decision and much more the serious than a normal care order, for instance, because there should be no contact in adoptions. As they said, and we have, we have a case now, Strand Lobben uh, against Norway, um, uh, but they again say that um, it's in the very nature of, adop of adoption that no real prospects of rehabilitation or family reunification exist, and that it's instead in the child's best interest to be placed permanently in a new family. And then we have this very, very famous sentence from Adele Johansson, uh, Johansson and, and repeated many times. Uh, such measures, that means adoption, should only be applied in exceptional circumstances and could only be justified if they were motivated by an overriding, overriding requirement pertaining to the child's best interest. Some adoption cases, uh, versus Norway, there, there was mentioned nine. This is just an example. Adele Johansson was, was early. That was a partly, it's always talked about as it was, Norway was violated, the whole article, but that's not quite right. Uh, Norway was violate, violated Article 8 because of the adoption and cutting all roots. But the court was uh, said that the, just the placement order, that was not, not any violation. But it was too, they, get, they made a too quick decision to go straight to adoption. Uh, Aune Saken, uh, Aune case, to the, uh, no violation, Strand Lobben, there is, this is a very interesting case because there is a majority and a mi minority dissent, dis, dis, dissenting. And as far as I know, this case will be decided in, in, the, in the whole court in October this year. Um, I'm a bit um, anxious for my time, but uh, I would like to give you some, some um, uh, quotations from the dissenting vote. The dissenting vote is very interesting, very interesting. Uh, just one minute. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe I can answer afterwards, but the point in the dissenting vote is that they are saying that the majority is dealing too abstract with the case, and there was a lot of concrete circumstances uh, concerning the mother in the case which the majority didn't take into consideration because of the new li life situation, for instance. And uh, it's wrong from the minority's point of view 
to to have the um, to look to own a case because own a case had quite a lot of effects. And then I just played it off. This is just uh, very, very briefly because um, Mr. Langford and the book you, you show, Norway is not on top. And we have the committee, uh, we have one of the committee's members here from, from Geneva, and she's not from Geneva, but the committee is, is, has the base in, 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 in Geneva. Uh, have just uh, just recently made a report on Norway's status uh, to to cope with uh, or comply with with, with with the Convention of Child Rights, and there are some criticism against Norway, and one of the most interesting uh, criticism is that the committee mean that we have too many placements out of home in Norway, too many, uh, and it's it's a point that maybe. Norway does too little to trying with uh, assistance measures, uh, go, uh, trying to help the parents, etc. This is a political question as, as well as a professional question, but it's very interesting that we have got this criticism. And I think that even if Norway is on the top of the list, Norway, that's right, Norway shouldn't uh, compare itself with Malawi or something else. Norway should compare itself with the absolutely best. We have a glorious past in this field, and Norway, sh we have the first child welfare law in the world. We have the child law of Kosberg. I can give you a new, new <laughs> lecture about it. And I mean, this is very important for Norway when we are talking about complying the convention. We should be the best in the class, and we should be so good that there should be no criticism at all from the committee in Geneva. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, so yesterday I, I spoke about my work with the IDEA project. Uh, today it's going to be something a, a little bit different. When I'm not working on the IDEA project, uh, I teach children's rights and constitutional law in, in the School of Law in, in, in Cork. And uh, I also direct the Child Law Clinic. And in the Child Law Clinic, we provide pro bono uh, legal research assistance to people who are taking cases involving uh, anything to do with children, very broadly defined. Uh, and among that, we have been involved in some interesting work on child protection cases, uh, including some cases before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so in 2014, we were involved in a successful application to the European Court of Human Rights in the case of O'Keefe versus Ireland, which involves the state's failure to protect children in primary schools from sexual abuse. Uh, and just this month, we've now lodged a further application relating to the same issue and relation to the state's uh, failure to uh, provide a remedy to people who were situated similarly to the applicant in that case. Uh, so what I'm going to do this morning, and, and this then tied in with my work for the IDEA project, because in developing training materials about the European Convention on Human Rights and about what the court has had to say about uh, child protection obligations, it became clear to me that uh, actually there's a real lack of literature in, in this area. Uh, and particularly the angle I'm going to speak about this morning on positive and procedural obligations. Uh, th this is something which is touched on in some of the, the, the fact sheets produced by the court and in the, the Fundamental Rights Agency handbook, uh, but in a very basic way. So those materials really only uh, list cases uh, under some headings. Uh, they don't go the next step of trying to tie those cases together and to map out the boundaries of where the obligations begin and end. Uh, and neither do they take the step after that, which is to analyze the case law and to see where are the strengths and the weaknesses and the reasoning of the court. Uh, so the first part of that for the, the training materials for IDEA, I've tried to work on the first part of that, and now I'm hoping to move that on to the second part for, for an article, which I hope to finish uh, in the next, uh, the next month or two. So to begin with just mapping out the boundaries of the obligations that the 
European Convention on Human Rights places on states' parties with respect to uh, child protection, it's actually very extensive. Uh, so the positive part of my presentation is to say that co the court is quite good in imposing quite far-reaching and detailed obligations on states uh, to protect children from uh, abuse or from harm or neglect. And in doing so, uh, it's quite common for the court to uh, make reference to Article 19 of the CRC uh, in its decisions. But I would argue probably that the European Convention on Human Rights case law is a better source than Article 19, because Article 19 is, is quite broad and quite vague. The general comments are, are written at a level of abstraction, whereas the case law coming from Strasbourg deals with the actual facts and flesh and blood of real cases. Uh, and that gives a level of detail and specificity to the obligations that I think is sometimes missing from what you get from the CRC, which is just, that's not a criticism of the CRC, it's just it's a different kind of instrument, and it doesn't have that body of jurisprudence. Now, these obligations arise at a number of levels. They arise before abuse ever occurs, they arise when abuse is occurring, and they arise after the abuse has finished. Uh, and they arise in respect of specific individuals, uh, but also in respect of uh, groups and, and in respect of general uh, obligations where you don't have any identified individuals or groups. So it's quite far reaching. Uh, the case law of the court, and I'm not going to get too far into the details of individual cases, but the court has held that there must be effective deterrence in domestic law against abuse from occurring. Um, this invo involves a number of different provisions of the convention. You have Article 3 for in, uh, the, the, the right to freedom from inhuman and degrading treatment, which deals with serious cases of abuse and neglect. You have Article 8, which deals with less serious violations of personal integrity. In the most serious cases where children die, uh, Article 2 and the right to life may become involved. Uh, and then finally, you have Article 13, which is the right to an effective remedy. So for your Article 3 cases, your cases of severe abuse or neglect, uh, there is an obligation that there must be effective criminal deterrence against that sort of behavior. For less serious violations, Sodom versus Sweden is an interesting case in that the court in that case, which involved um, secret filming of a, a teenage girl in a shower, uh, the court in that case didn't examine that under Article 3. It did accept that it was a violation of Article 8 uh, and her, her right to, to privacy and private life. Uh, but it accepted in principle that in those cases that while criminal laws might not be necessary that there should be civil redress uh, available against the perpetrator. So that's deterrence before the abuse ever occurs. The laws should be in there to try and stop it from happening. Now when abuse is happening, then there is an obligation on the state to respond to that abuse and to protect children who are being abused. And that arises both where you have children who are being subjected to direct harm. Uh, Zed versus United Kingdom was a case of serious ongoing neglect and abuse in the family home. Uh, ES versus Slovakia was a domestic violence case, but also indirect harm. And there's quite a few cases involving Moldova uh, around domestic violence around children who are not personally being subjected to the domestic violence, but who witness the domestic violence and who are harmed in that way. Again, the state has an obligation to, to respond uh, to protect those children. But beyond protecting children who the state knows are being abused, there are also obligations to protect against risks. Uh, so risks where the state doesn't know that a particular child is being abused, but either knew or ought to have known that those children were at risk of being abused. That arises, first of all, in respect of specific individuals. Uh, so cases like Controva or E versus the UK, where you had particular children living in very uh, particular circumstances involving severe domestic violence or contact with known abusers and so on, where the state did not know those children were being abused, but should have known that they were at risk of being abused and should have taken steps to prevent that abuse from occurring. In O'Keefe versus Ireland, then, that took that one step further because it goes beyond specific individual children and it concerns just the more general notion that children in the school system as a class were at risk of being abused. And therefore, the state, without ever having knowledge of particular children being at risk, the state should take measures to protect against a general risk to all children in the school system. Where abuse has occurred, we then move into the procedural obligations that the state must mount an effective investigation into that allegations of abuse. And finally then, where violations have occurred, you have cases which hold that a remedy should be available against the state to establish state responsibility for that abuse. So as I say, it's quite an extensive range of obligations. And to, to that extent, I think it's, it's quite a positive body of case law. Where we can be a little more skeptical, um, and I see I only have three minutes to do this, so this will be at a, at a pretty broad level, uh, is just in some of the inconsistencies which arise in that case law. Um, so what we see 
is that um, I've, I've pulled out three different examples of inconsistencies in how the case, the court handles these cases. Uh, first of all, there's the question of people who go to Strasbourg and argue their case under both Article 3 and Article 8. A very understandable thing to do as a lawyer, you're always thinking, well, if you don't hit the Article 3 threshold of inhuman integrating treatment, you have Article 8 as a fallback. Um, what happens then is the court, in some cases, finds a violation of both Article 3 and Article 8, uh, but in other cases, the court uh, decides that if there is a violation of Article 3, there's no need to make a separate finding under Article 8. And there's no real reason given in the case law for why some cases take one approach and other cases take the other. Then moving on to the substantive versus the procedural aspect. So uh, the substantive aspect being the idea that the state should prevent the abuse from occurring uh, versus the procedural aspect, which is that the state should investigate the abuse after it has occurred. Uh, and again, there is some inconsistency in how those, those uh, issues are handled. In some cases, the court is very careful to clearly separate out those obligations using different headings and different sections of the judgment in, in, on, on occasion. Uh, whereas in other cases, the court doesn't make any attempt to separate out those obligations. It just bundles them all in together. And finally, then, the, the idea of a right to a remedy under Article 13. We have some cases where a violation of Article 3 or Article 8 is found, uh, and then the court quickly moves to say that that then gives rise to an entitlement to a remedy under Article 13. But other cases which decline to do so, often for no apparent reason. Now, there may be a reason in the case law here that I'm missing. I'm working at the moment on trying to figure out what it is. And I've developed a long list of what it's not. But I haven't yet managed to pin down what it is. Um, so these are some of the inconsistencies arising in the case law. Why do these matter? Well, in some ways, the first one doesn't matter enormously. Uh, you know, once there is a violation found, you know, whether that is a violation of just Article 3 or Article 3 and Article 8, doesn't really make a huge difference. It's really just, uh, you know, a slight lack of rigor and a lack of consistency in the reasoning of the court. Um, but the other two do matter. So to, on the question of whether you decide that there is a substantive violation or a procedural violation, that matters because that is a question of the court deciding whether or not the state actually was in some way responsible, partly, for the abuse having occurred. Um, so if you find a procedural obligation, you were not saying that the state was responsible for the abuse. You were simply saying the state failed to investigate the abuse, which is not the same thing. But where you find a substantive obligation, you were saying, actually, the state was partly responsible for the fact that the abuse occurred in the first place. So that's quite a different thing. And so that's somewhere where I think it's, you know, it's important that the court be more careful in deciding where is the dividing line between what is a substantive obligation, what is a procedural obligation, and when violations are found of one or the other or both. And finally, then, on the question of whether a, 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 a violation of Article 13 is found, uh, that is important when it comes to implementing the judgment and the question of general measures of implementation. So every violation which is found against the state, the state is required to have specific measures of implementation in relation to that individual and then general measures of implementation in respect of society at large. If there is no violation of Article 13 found, then there is no obligation on the state to have a general uh, measure of implementation in relation to a remedy. In simple terms, the state is not obliged to compensate similarly situated people. Whereas if there is a violation of Article 13, then the state is obliged to compensate similarly situated people without those people having to take repeated cases to Strasbourg. And so it matters whether or not a separate violation is found of Article 13. But as I say, uh, it's unclear at the moment uh, why it is in some cases that does happen, but in other cases that doesn't happen. So that's as far as I, I have taken this analysis so far, but I hope to develop that uh, over the coming weeks, and I'll be very happy to, to take questions on it. Thank you. Hello again. Um, it is a pleasure to be uh, in a panel of judges, uh, lawyers. I am, I'm, I'm already within the uh, framework of, of, of court judgments. But, but uh, here in Bergen, it doesn't happen too often that, that I only have uh, uh, lawyers with whom uh, I have this discussion with. Um, on the other hand, uh, today I will present uh, preliminary findings of the research that I'm conducting together with Marit Schivenes. And uh, uh, we will have a more thorough uh, presentation of this in, in the conference in Porto 
where we will also discuss children's rights. Um, the uh, ongoing research project is focusing on the judgments from the European Court of Human Rights that have in their factual basis a removal of a newborn baby. And we define a newborn uh, as a child who has lived with the parents maximum uh, 30 days. Um, most of these children are, however, moved uh, from the family already uh, in the hospital or very shortly after some kind of institutional um, staying, staying in some kind of institution uh, with the mother and, and then the child is removed. And the research question we are trying to answer is whether the European Court of Human Rights has a specific criteria for removing newborn children. When um, can the state remove uh, the newborn? What are the boundaries given by the convention uh, to these kind of uh, removals? And uh, two concepts that we operationalize within this research are the margin, margin of appreciation. Um, this is the room given to the states to make decisions and what is necessary in a democratic society, what is then the, this kind of balancing criteria, um, uh, what risks, what interests have to be balanced in order to uh, make the decision relating to these newborns. Um, legal criteria is in Article 8. I will not uh, go thoroughly uh, through it, but uh, perhaps there are some key uh, words in it that need to be noticed. First, every removal has to be in accordance with law. It means that there has to be specific criteria for removing the child in the domestic legislation. And this domestic legislation is applied when the child is removed. And secondly, um, this removal has to be necessary in a democratic society. And in the interest of either then the uh, health or morals, or then the rights and freedoms of others, and this is usually then the child whose rights and freedoms we are talking about. And uh, the court has extensive case law on removals. Um, it has stressed that removal has to be the last measure. Uh, it has stressed that uh, family reunification is the goal. It has stressed that uh, the state has to uh, apply different measures before it removes the child. Um, but when you think of the newborns, then, then these are the children that are um, in the most vulnerable situation. Uh, they have no possibility of coping by the, their own. On the other hand, they have no life experience, they have no connections to the outside world. So in that sense, there is perhaps less to be considered when a child is being removed as a newborn. Um, we have found uh, 11 cases in the court's uh, caseload. Um, we are looking only at judgments, so we are not looking at admissibility decisions uh, or the t decisions of the former commission. Um, the last judgment, Strandloven versus Norway, is the one ongoing uh, uh, in the Grand Chamber. So we have 10 final decisions of final judgments and then one uh, this kind of first step judgment that might be revised. Um, as you can see, then, uh, the variety of countries is, is uh, there. There are three cases against the UK, there are two cases against uh, Norway, and there are then other countries involved. Um, we selected the cases on the basis of facts. So when in the facts there was a fact of removal of a newborn, this case was selected. Now, here comes my first disclaimer. The fact that the newborn was removed doesn't mean that the court necessarily deals with the newborn removal within its substantive considerations. And actually, we find that it rarely discusses it. Um, and there are several reasons why this can be. Uh, the main being that uh, the court decides the cases on the basis of the application. And uh, it is up to the applicant to submit where it finds the violation. Um, quite so often, this violation has been procedural. There are cases, uh, for example, uh, K&T versus Finland, where the newborn removal fact was not so much contested, but what was contested was then uh, uh, the uh, visitation rights and, and non-review of the, of the case later in a later stage. Um, we also have... Um, um, 
Jovanovic versus Sweden, an interesting case uh, concerning a violence uh, against the child shaken baby syndrome, where the main discussion in the court was not the removal fact itself, but the fact that uh, the uh, social uh, services did not review the case, and after the uh, marriage had dissolved, did not return the child to the, uh, to the mother, who said that I have not uh, shaken the baby. Um, um, we have Kocherev uh, and Sergeyeva versus Russia, an interesting case of mental health or mental disability where uh, the child uh, was born into a family where the mother did not have any legal capacity and where the father was, was mentally uh, disabled and then there was a question of, of whether uh, the father could actually take care of the older child. Uh, so. Quite often you see that although in the fact the newborn is there, the newborn is removed, the court only rarely discusses what are actually the criteria for removal. And uh, the one case where it has been discussed is Hase versus Germany, but th this is a tricky case on the other hand because there are about ch five children removed at the same time. So does the court's consideration concern the newborn or do the court's consideration concern the removal of all the children together from the family. In this case, of course, we can see that, that uh, the court considered removal of a newborn from the hospital um, while being under the care and under the supervision of the uh, state. Hospital is a state-owned uh, institution. Uh, there are medical personnel who can observe and, and assist the parents. Um, and um, the risk for the family was violence against the older children, not against the newborn. So uh, there was this kind of strong emphasis that removal of a newborn because of violence against old children is perhaps unnecessarily harsh measure. Uh, there are questions relating to the needs of the newborn uh, that are a bit more discussed in this case. To generalize our conclusions is then that um, Article 8 in uh, theory as well as in these cases leaves the court uh, or leaves the nation, national state a lot of leeway, a lot of room for deciding. And when the uh, national court and national legislation is precise enough, it can happen that there are no violations found uh, by the court. Um, but this, there is a prerequisite that the procedure that has been followed is fair, uh, it has considered all documents, it has allowed the parents to be involved in this procedure, and, and then uh, the court uh, will most likely uh, find that the procedure has been correct and, and, and there have been all these possibilities. So if we go back very shortly to the, um, to the uh, caseload here, then in Kocherov and Sergeyeva, for example, uh, the court, uh, European Court of Human Rights stated that the national decision maker did not take into account expert opinions, uh, stating that the father was capable. Uh, it did not take into account all the evidence presented to it. In KNT versus Finland, uh, there was a discussion of involvement of parents into the decision-making procedure. Um, in um, yeah, um, and there are this kind of procedural violations in most of the cases, as you can see. Quite often, Article Six uh, relating to the procedural rights uh, are also included in the in the list. Um, and also what the court looks into is what types of risks are the child uh, faced with, what are the risks to the specific newborn or later than the risks to the child. And um, if these risks are substantiated, if these risks have been balanced in the court against the rights of the, of the parents, if, uh, for example, there are remedies like visitation rights or then uh, um, possibility of review later, then uh, the court would agree with the national state and say that, that you have uh, used your discretion correctly. Um, there are still certain substantive considerations. Firstly, removal has to be a temporary measure especially when we talk about a newborn, um, when there is a possibility, like in the Russian case there was, that the parent can cope with the older child, then this should be given the preference. Uh, the, uh, the reunification is the aim of, uh, uh, of the, one of the aims of the con convention. And uh, um, 
It is also important that the state has shown and has considered substantively what are the alternatives to the removal. If it, if it has not done it, then there is a violation of the convention. Um, we, were, or we are wondering whether and to what extent does the court concern with the future of the child. Um, here I cannot conclude anything uh, yet. Uh, but, but this will definitely be uh, an issue that, that we will address when, when we will finalize the, uh, our writings. And thank you. Thank you, and thank you also to the previous speakers for very interesting presentations. Uh, I don't have any slides, but hopefully I can still catch the attention of the audience. Uh, I will make some reflections. Uh, first of all, the starting point of most of the cases are what is necessary in a democratic society. We are speaking about discretion, and what we see is a court with a very wide discretion. It's very fascinating to see, I mean, give this phrase necessary in a democratic society to various Supreme Courts throughout Europe and make them have case law for 30 years. That is an experiment that we, can never, that we could never carry out, but if we did so, you will see that the outcome would have been very different. The case law would have been evolving differently. So there is a wide discretion. And the European Court of Human Rights is sitting in, as you know, in Strasbourg, then sitting far away from the incidents. That is the same for Supreme Courts throughout Europe. But still, they are dealing with issues under a legal system that they don't know very well. That's always the case. And also, there is the timeline, although it's a bit better now than it was in previous years, when often it was 10 years after the incidents that the case was brought before the Strasbourg court. Uh, this, what is necessary in democratic society is developed by the court. And I think it's important to mention that this has been cases that has been driven by the parents. Most of the complaints before the courts are stemming from complaints either the parents themselves or if the child are also involved, very often they are using the same advocate as the parents. And of course, I mean, I don't want to criticize any parents, of course. Uh, I would have done the same if it was my children. So it's not about this, but that means that that has been a driving force. I think it's also interesting and necessary to mention that the court has in recent years, I would say, and this is my opinion, and hopefully someone would agree, disagree, and hopefully someone would agree also, that the court in recent years is a bit more careful of finding a violation. They never state this in the judgments. They're not saying, well, now we are a bit more careful. They're using exactly the same phrases as they have done. But still, I think the court is a bit more careful. Then the court is often stressing that there is differences in Europe when it comes to taking children into care. And when it comes to children, there are differences in Europe. I mean, I was. <laughs> I'm currently the dean, and then we have different meetings with deans from other law faculties. And in a lunch, I was sitting with dean from another country, and he was stating, well, of course, we are using light corporal punishment. That's common, and I do that from time to time. If I was sitting in a lunch here <laughs> and stating that I am from time, from time to time using light corporal punishment, well, then I would be out of office very soon. That is something that you cannot state in Norway, but you can state that in other countries. 
that does, doesn't mean that, I mean, he, I guess he seemed, I think he's a good partner, of course, but there are differences throughout Europe when it comes to how to raise a child. Then it is, <coughs> as mentioned by Gerhard Andersland and also uh, by other speakers, taking into care is a temporary measure. And I think that is a statement that the court has used very frequently, but I think it's also a statement that we could reflect a bit on. Is it, as a lawyer, this is a very kind of sound approach. This is about proportionality. If you have an intrusive measure, of course you should only use this intrusive measure for a short period. If you are keeping uh, people in detention, that should be for the shortest possible duration. But when it comes to children, I think that uh, as a starting point, it's fine, but you have to have some kind of comments or additions to this, because otherwise it seems like the child is a package, and for a child to be moved back and forth is not in the best interest of the child. But it's important to stress that taking, into child, taking a child into custody is an intrusive measure, and it should be a high threshold for doing so, but it's very difficult to formulate this threshold, even by a court. Uh, and you cannot, regardless of how you formulate this, there will be a discretion on the decision maker, either in the county board in Hodelan or in a city court in some city in Europe. When it, it comes to the cases against Norway, as mentioned by, by others, many of those have concerned adoption. And of course, adoption is an intrusive measure because it is cutting all ties between the child and the parents. So that adoption has gained that much of attention. I think that is rather understandable. But I think it's important to stress that there are a lot of other measures within childcare that are not before, brought before the Court of Human Rights, which could have been of interest. So I think it's important to stress that even though all the cases brought before Norway, they will be decided during the next years. And if the outcome should be that none of the cases are showing that there has been a violation, that does not mean that the child welfare system in Norway is perfect. It only indicates that in these cases there has no, been no violation. So therefore, I think if you should look on the issue, human rights, child welfare, Norway, it is important to stress that the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg is only one instrument. We have already mentioned the CSE committee in Geneva, and they have criticized Norway when it comes to taking into care. As many of you know, if you go into the figures of Norway, you will see that in northern part of Norway, in the country of Finnmark, it is, I think, three to four times as likely that the child will be taken into care as in southern Norway. And of course, you can, I mean, as a lawyer, I think, of course, there is a difference here and something is wrong. But I realized maybe it's not anything wrong, but it is indeed a topic that is well worth investigating. It could only be differences in the social uh, social welfare system or uh, social differences, but it could also be other factors, and I think that's really a topic that is important to go into, but that could never be solved by the European Court of Human Rights because they're only taking individual cases. Uh, we have mentioned emergency care. Some of the cases brought before the Supreme Court are concerning emergency care, but I think when you go into the figures of Norway, you will see that many of the child who are taken into care is according to an emergency decision. And, well, to some extent that is unavoidable because, well, this should be a measure of last resort. Then you are waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering whether the child should be taken into care or not. And when you say enough is enough, well, it's enough today. 
So there is some kind of, you could say, it is understandable, but still it is an emergency procedure. That means there is a less of mechanism to provide the interest of the parents and the children, and I think that there is a need for more reflections on emergency care because it's often used. Then it's the role of the experts. Some of the cases brought before the European Court of Human Rights has touched upon the role of the experts, but I think it's important that we discuss this and try to be balanced. I mean, we need experts in child protection cases, but we have to reflect, are we using the experts in the best way, and could we have kind of other approaches than that we have chosen. Then I have only one minute left, and uh, I will only use this minute. Uh, and that's very difficult for me. Uh, I think we need the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights has made Norwegian lawyers aware of potential weaknesses of Norwegian law that we have never discussed if it was not for the European Court of Human Rights. But we also have to discuss the role of the European Court of Human Rights. To some extent, I think they are not addressing or solving the cases in the best way. And I think that the only way to continue this is to have discussions like this and addressing the, 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 str the strength and the weaknesses both of the Norwegian system and of the protection under the European Court of Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. We'll do the same as the group before the session before us. If we, we have any questions from the audience, please just feel free to ask, and we will then answer in turn after the questions have been asked. Are there any questions? I wonder if there is some anarchism going on in Norway about the child welfare and the laws, the, the human rights law in uh, Norway. Sorry, once more. Just repeat the question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>